So, and then finally, I'm going to close with the last thing, uh, the last pathogen that I believe is something that is uh, of a problem and emerging ac across the eastern board, anywhere from North Carolina all the way up until uh, the, the south of Canada. People have issues with defoliation from this fungus. Uh, it's caused by a fungus called Marcelina coronaria. These are the spores that you see in the central image, the, the canidia, the asexual spores of the pathogen. And on the right side, you can see roughly 40% to 40 60% defoliation, roughly around like mid-September. And that causes a lot of distress for people who have pick your own operations, they don't want to have that. Um, and it's actually caused by this fungus. And this was in 2017. We had issues with it in 2018 as well. And one thing that was difficult for us is to work with this uh, fungus. It's just we have to get it out of the leaves and have a pure culture so we can work in the lab with it. And in Switzerland, this is a big issue on apple that also it causes blotches on fruit. So in the northern part of Italy and Switzerland, it can cause symptoms on fruit. And we thought, okay, let's go and try to find symptoms on fruit. And we did. That's the way how we were able to get this fungus out and work on it. And we teamed up with uh, Carrie Peter from Penn State, who's my uh, counterpart in Pennsylvania. And we were able to confirm that we do actually have this pathogen, Marcina coronaria, in New York. We don't know whether this pathogen has always been here or it's a newly emerging pathogen. But, you know, we didn't have it in the past as an issue. But now it seems to be present in the last three or four years. It seems to be... Uh, in, in the orchards, and it can cause blotches in the fruit as well, not only on the leaves. So when you have defoliation in the leaves, you might be having spots on fruit. And sometimes when you get these fruit picked up and, and stored, when you get them out of the storage, they can have these spots. So call me if you do, because we would like to love to get our hands on these fruit so we can actually get the fungus out and work on it. We also collaborate with Switzerland uh, uh, pathologists. Uh, uh, Thomas is the one that we work in the Organic Institute for, uh, of, of Switzerland. He's our good collaborator there. We're working with him on trying to determine how did this pathogen, you know, become to be such a problem in our region and in their region as well. There are issues. People call me and get confused. What are uh, different symptoms? So if you can focus your attention to the middle of this uh, uh, cartoon, you can see how the symptoms from Marcinina leaf blotch actually look like, but on the left is not uh, Marcinina leaf blotch. On the left, you see necrotic leaf blotch, which is a physiological disorder typical for bold and delicious and some other varieties. The, the, the blotches are bigger and irregular, whereas the, whereas the Marcinina leaf blotch spots are small. And um, then on the right side, you, you see the frog eye leaf spot. So it, there are certain differences that you, can, you, sh you should look at, and it's not, not everything is Marcinina leaf blotch. And then eventually, uh, when the leaves start dropping off, you see these frondy edges of these of the Marcinina leaf blotch. So it varies also depending on the time when you look at the symptoms. The reason why this pathogen is really becoming an issue is because we have had times in New York in 2017 when the rain uh, was so frequent that over like 40 uh, days we had um, you know wet conditions. And that seems to be based on this research by the Korean group in 2011, just shows you, depending on how many uh, moist days you have, how much infection you have. So the three day moisture on the, on the, on the leaves can lead to 72% severity on the, on the leaves if you didn't apply any fungicide. So the more moisture you have, the more disease you have. And that explains why in June and July, the rains that happened in 2017 led to this pathogen to really set in really hard um, in different apple cultivars. So the, not only us had the infections, uh, there's Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Virginia and North Carolina reported it, Canada as well. In the past, uh, this pathogen has been described in China and Korea and in uh, European Union and Brazil. Seems to be unusually wet summers that actually cause this pathogen to occur. Especially organic orchards are heavily uh, damaged by defoliation. And there's no label fungicides, uh, at least in New York, that you could use against Marcelina. Um, and this fungus has low susceptibility to copper, so the copper might be the issue not being effective against this in organic orchards. Varieties that are susceptible are listed in red there, and I'm going to go and read them to you. But I want to mention to you that this is just preliminary based on what we received as samples throughout the last three years. Those are the samples that we have seen, those are the trees or varieties that we have seen um, defoliated by this fungus. 
Uh, we do have varieties that are model resistant, okay, such as these uh, Chinese varieties that you see in blue there and also Pinova and Akane, but they're not as, as prevalent or at all existing in, in the northern United States. Uh, just briefly to mention to you that this pathogen is really important in, in Asia. They even have a breeding program uh, 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 to breed the resistance into rootstocks, not only varieties, but also rootstocks against this fungus because it causes huge issues in uh, rootstock uh, liner production. So it can defoliate uh, liners and then you lose the, the yield of them so that you can actually use them to graft on. If you can, uh, if your orchard is too small or is smaller on the smaller side, we would definitely recommend you to apply urea at 40 pounds if you're a conventional grower and uh, dissolve that in 100 gallons so that you can actually spray that on the leaf litter or just before leaf drop on the trees. Or if you are an organic orchard, uh, you know, a grower, uh, then you should use dolomite lime at two and a half tons per acre because either of these options allow degradation of leaves much faster and it seems the pathogen overwinters really well in the leaves. So if you can prune well to get good air circulation to dry the leaves faster, that's, that's good. And then there's different fungicides that different research shows to be that they are effective, like Mancozeb, the Mataram, Topsim, and Thiophenet, Methyl, and Maravon seem to be effective. So, and also the DMI fungicides, uh, such as Phi Super might be effective. But we don't have any efficacy trials for this fungus yet in the valley. And some research is being done in Pennsylvania, so might, might bring up to some option in the future. So it seems not to be a widespread problem, but more and more people have issues in the years that are unpres with unprecedented amount of rain during the summer. This is the life cycle of the pathogen. If you uh, look at the, uh, the left side middle image, um, this is the leaves, how they look like, and the black and white image shows you that pathogen overwinters on, on dropped leaves. And that's where we want to apply the urea or dolomite to get uh, the dolomitic lime to, to get the degradation of those leaves. The pathogen can form an asexual form, a servuli, a disc-like shaped fruiting bodies that forms sexual spores. And also the asexual uh, spores called conidia in, in the uh, uh, servuli survive. I'm sorry, I made a, made a mistake. Uh, the sexual stage has apothecia. The pathogen then survives on the leaves both as, as apothecia or in sexual stage or conidia, and then it can infect with rain in the, in the spring. And then it has multiple cycles of conidia that keep on infecting if you don't have fungicide coverage, all the way up until the new leaves drop and you get defoliation of the trees and that's where the pathogen survives. We don't know whether we have a sexual stage, the apothecia in New York, and many locations in the world think that pathogen uh, survives only as a asexual uh, stage on the leaves. If you pay RIMPRO for a uh, subscription for SCAB, again, another model for the same cost of the SCAB model, it is really great. You can also get prediction for when the first infection during the season can happen from Marsunino leaf blotch. Uh, so it's very useful. Uh, it works in the same capacity as Sudivach and FlySpec mode, gives you the indi indication when the first infection happened and you have to apply something that's very effective against Marsunino just before that infection and you should be able to control it pretty well. We work with this fungus, this pathogen in the lab. We test different fungicides to see how effective they are. We do see a little bit more um, um, uh, effect of diphenoconazole versus other fungicides, but this is just preliminary still. We're, st we're still working on it. And this is the lab scenario where we mix a medium on which this pathogen grows in the lab. Uh, and it's not the same as, as testing them in the field. So that's the plan in the future. Um, and we're gonna see if we can do that. But you know, we want to be um, ahead of the curve, prevent any potential resistance in this fungus to fungicides. And that's the reason why we're screening these fungicides for this, on this fungus. There is research uh, uh, in Switzerland, actually in Germany, that has been published recently for organic producers. This is an efficacy trial in 2016 and at the bottom graph in 2017. How did 10 to 12 spray applications of each of these products that you see at the bottom of the graph how did they actually turn out if, if they sprayed from uh, roughly about like 10th, 10th to 12th June up until 30th August? And the most effective you can see that are consistent of both, uh, both trials is this mycosin or the acid, acidified clay and mycosin pl plus sulfur. And in this case of 2016, they had good results with uh, copper uh, fung fung fungoran progress. 
So it seems that there is some options for organic growers you could use, but the mycosin that is listed here is not allowed or registered in the United States because it has a high content of aluminum there, which might you know, bring up to uh, contamination of the soil, but it seems that organic growers are certified in Europe to use the, these products that might be very effective on this very intensive schedule of spraying to protect against mercenary leaf blotch there. So this is, I'm just, just mentioning to you the way how the clays work. Mycosin works in the way that the clay actually uh, has aluminum content that somehow, um, you know, basically is uh, inhibiting spore germination on the leaves. And by increasing the aluminum content, that spores can germinate. The clay also allows to uh, absorb water. Uh, you know, the clay absorbs water, and that, that's the way how it actually reduces the, the wetness after the rain and somewhat you know, reduces the risk of infections. So that's one way how, how the clays can help. But not all the clays are the same. This specific one may be very effective, whereas maybe kaolin or somebody, some other clay might be completely different properties. So it's not the same if you use maybe some, something else that is registered. 